Business AM. Radio Special Cyber Security. Welkom hier bij Business AM. Ik ben Sophie Sonk en deze radio special staat in het teken van cybersecurity. De vele facetten ervan, de innovaties, de gevaren van nieuwe technologieën, de ethische kwesties en de gevolgen natuurlijk voor bedrijven. Ik heb een gesprek over Generative AI met mevrouw Nina Schiek, auteur, adviseur en spreker rond Generative AI. Ik praat met haar in het Engels. Welkom, Miss Schiek. Thank you for having me, Sophie. You are an author, entrepreneur and advisor specializing in generative AI. Generative AI refers to a category of AI algorithms that generate new outputs based on the data they have been trained on. So there is still a human factor to it or not even that. I would argue that this is generative AI is basically a new form of AI, meaning that It can create something new. This is different from traditional or discriminatory AI, which was more about classifying data. But generative AI, what it can create seems to be almost that it can create everything we thought was unique to human intelligence or creativity. So at first glance, it seems that thanks to generative AI, There's no need for any human element. But the more you get to know about it and how these systems will be deployed, the more you understand that this can actually be a tool for people. But actually in terms of generating or creating the content, you won't need people to do Mm -hmm. that. That will be automated. And you are on a mission to make AI accessible for companies and also for a wider audience. What's so wrong with the flood of chat GPTs that will storm the world like a tsunami of bot generated data and information? So I believe that generative AI is going to fundamentally change the digital ecosystem. It's fundamentally going to change the way we live, the change we work. I think it's even going to change our very perception of what it means to be human. So my mission to make AI accessible, yes, I work with companies advising in a business context, but more important than that, I believe that every single person deserves to understand how this exponential technology is going to change their experience of what it means to be human. And one example of that is ChatGPT. ChatGPT is the most popular and successful application, not only of generative AI, but it's the most popular application of all time. ChatGPT got 100 million users Mm -hmm. in two, two months since its launch. So... As with all exponential technologies, and this being the most powerful technology I think we've seen to date, it has both positive and negative elements. Mm -hmm. And I think that everybody deserves to understand the context in which this is unfolding and both the risks and opportunities. As you said before, ChatGPT is the fastest growing app in the world. Well, well over 100 million users already, as you mentioned. Is it okay to trust a chatbot prompting text generated by data and uh, algorithms? And will this change the way humans think? I think that the information we consume on a daily basis in the digital ecosystem will increasingly be AI generated. So I think it's inevitable that AI generated content, if AI becomes the vehicle for production or the engine for production of human intelligence and creativity, I think it's inevitable that it's going to change the way that we think. The second question, the second point I want to make goes to your question of whether we should trust a chatbot. And it's really important to know that these systems or these machines, they're not godlike. They're not omnipotent. They're not infallible. So should you trust a chatbot? No, you should understand it for what it is. It's a chatbot and it can lie and it can hallucinate and it can get things wrong. Does mm-hmm. it have tremendous ability when used in the right way? Absolutely. But is it something that you should fundamentally trust as being 100% correct all the time? Yeah. No. Let's say in a few years time, the mistakes and the non-truths made by chatbots will be solved. You will still need people to edit and opinionate articles. Am I wrong? Absolutely. I mean, 
this is again one of the most philosophical questions around generative AI. Is it going to automate humanity or machines going to take over? But I believe that this is a tool for humanity and everything that the machine produces needs to be curated, guided, edited, controlled by humans. It's mm -hmm. just that our our role in the production process is going to change where we become more like curators rather than being stuck in the kind of mm -hmm. technical aspect of production. Yeah, a million of people will interact with artificial intelligence. What will be the impact on a global scale? How decisive is this technology going to become in every part of our society in the next five to ten years? Or should I say how disruptive? It's going to be impacting hundreds of millions and billions of people. My my estimate was by the end of 2023, generative AI. When I made that estimate, uh, some people didn't believe me, but now it looks like that's going to come true within a few months just through chat GPT alone, right? So its impact on humanity is undeniable and probably at a pace that we've never experienced before. So how will this impact the world? I think this is the fastest acceleration of technology we've known up to date. And you have to take that in its historical context because just the rate of both technological acceleration, but also adoption has been growing exponentially from the internet to smartphones and now the AI revolution. It's even faster than anything mm -hmm. we've known before. Mm -hmm. Tech uh, giants will be, yeah, they want to dominate, I think, the business of it and exploit it. How will we will deal with that? I think that you see a fundamental repositioning by all of the tech giants to own a slice of the generative AI pie. And I think that the whole success of this field almost took them by surprise. They understood that this arena had promise, but I don't think anyone expected things to unfold as quickly as they have. And for as many people as there are already now a few months down the line since the release of ChatGPT to be interfacing with generative AI products, tools, and services. So there is no doubt that there's a kind of AI race on between the tech giants, which is going to accelerate this whole field. It's going to make it more accessible. It's going to mean that these tools are going to become uh, more money, more accessibility, more people using them, more widely dispersed, which is all going to add to my prediction of how this is going to unfold quicker than we could have ever imagined before. But it's not only the tech giants who are going to dominate this field because there is a flourishing open source community and now lots of models and lots of generative AI tools, products and services are also being built by smaller companies and in the open source community. Mm -hmm. It took a few decades, but artificial intelligence is here to stay. It is evading both the corporate and consumer world. People fear for their jobs as AI will generate about 90% of all content that is needed. Is that fear justified? It's justified because I think we're going to see a revolutionization of the labor market. And this is, you're not talking about automating color jobs, right? Like factory line workers, it's kind of already happened, this, this, this disruption, but you're talking about white color workers. So the automation of things like software developers, uh, graphic designers, lawyers, script writers, authors. I think that certain jobs or aspects of jobs in industries will be automated by AI, let's be real. But I also think that it's a fallacy to think about the number of human jobs as being finite and that those jobs that are taken by AI can't be replaced. Because mm -hmm. I think that generative AI as a tool, human productivity, human creativity, human output, is there's just going to be more. There mm -hmm. isn't a finite gap on human productivity or human activity. Yeah. So I think that's going to manifest in new jobs, different jobs, more jobs. There seems to be a positive and a negative side to all of this. Eh? Do you see this technology also being used as a weapon? There's no doubt this technology being used as a weapon. Um, because ultimately, this is a story about humanity. This is a story about humans and what we do when we have extremely powerful tools at our disposal. And what we're already seeing is that some people try to do incredible things 
like use generative AI to pioneer medical research, to find new drugs, to find cures for cancer, to make creativity accessible to everyone, to use generative AI to personalize education so that disenfranchised people who have no access to the internet or educational opportunities are able to do so through the help of AI. And there's absolutely no doubt that this will be weaponized as a tool of disinformation, as a tool of identity theft, as a tool of uh, mass fraud. So ultimately, this to me is the perfect embodiment or exemplification of the very nature of humanity. With the yin comes the yang. We gaan er heel even uit. We zijn zo terug met Nina Schick met meer over synthetische content. Business AM. Radio Special Cybersecurity. We zijn er terug met Nina Schick, auteur en adviseur over Generative AI. We hebben het er nog altijd over cybersecurity. Meer bepaald over de impact van de synthetische content. Content gegenereerd door bots, nu die baanbrekende technologie stormenderwijs de wereld verovert. Miss Schick, AI is good at creating fake media. It creates people who don't even exist. It can spread pictures of these non-existing people. It creates identities and have them spread their opinions. It sounds like a nightmare. Why isn't this considered illegal? I mean, when we joke about it, people tolerate the fake news that is funny. But when it is influencing, for instance, a sale or a contract or an election... It is undermining democracy, not? Absolutely. Why isn't it illegal? Um, I wrote a book about AI-generated content. I wrote the first book about AI-generated content in which I took a very, the approach of how this is going to undermine information integrity, how this is going to undermine democracies, how this is a potent new vector for identity theft and fraud, because One of the really astonishing things about generative AI or AI generated content is that AI can learn to clone anybody. If I have enough training data, that is some kind of digital media of you speaking in a video or some digital audio recordings of your voice, that can be used for AI to learn to train, to emulate your voice, to recreate your voice, to recreate your face. So. The very first place that generative AI started emerging back in 2017 was in pornography, because porn is always so pioneering and women's identities, because this was undeniably gendered, were being stolen to put them in AI assisted porn. Now, why haven't we said this should be illegal and we regulate against identities being stolen in this way? But why haven't we? This low hanging fruit. It's so obvious that this Mm -hmm. should be illegal. And the only answer I can give to that is probably because the changes have been happening so quickly or the advances have been happening so quickly that policy policy makers and regulators are far behind. So Mm -hmm. something that is as low hanging fruit as this, the stealing of somebody's identity to clone them in malicious content, not being made illegal is a travesty in my view. Mm -hmm. As humans, we are primed to want to believe something that looks and sounds right. It's a cognitive bias known as processing fluency. It's clear that the tricks pulled by AI are way smarter than the next version of Photoshop. Why do we want machines to edit and generate our media and our content? Who wants that? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, this was a question I asked myself when I first started going into this field, given my background was in information warfare and disinformation. Uh, we do have a cognitive bias to want to believe things that look and sound right. You, you, as you correctly pointed out, it's called processing fluency. But it's important to remember that AI-generated content isn't only being deployed or used with the express intent of deceiving people. AI-generated content is also to make, like I mentioned, our experience of being humans different, perhaps better through things like research, through better entertainment experiences as a new infrastructure for communication, information, and knowledge. But of course, one part of this is that 
the integrity of the information ecosystem, the integrity of all media that we interact with can become degraded if we don't know what's mm-hmm. synthetic, what's authentic, what's fake, what's not, what's real, what's not. So if you accept, as I do, that AI will become a engine for content creation and that the cat's out of the bag, the next question then is, what do we need to do so that we can still have some level of trust in all content that we interact with and with the digital information ecosystem writ large? And to me, the answer is full transparency. Mm-hmm. So if you are using AI to generate your content, this should be signed. It should be absolutely transparent that this came from an algorithm that this is AI generated and the technology to do this already exists. Um, As a matter of fact, um, next week, we are going to be releasing the first piece of signed AI generated content. So this should be something that is adopted as a standard across platforms, across the whole internet, why don't we make the ecosystem a place where it's easier to trust the content we interact with mm-hmm. when the technology that is already mm-hmm. available? Is there a need for, say, a synthetic detector, a detective machine that can probe into the synthetic content of other machines? And if it exists, is it any good? So synthetic content detectors have been a field in development for quite a few years. Um, Certainly when deepfakes first started emerging in 2017, you know, the first kind of viral form of generative AI, immediately lots of brilliant minds, researchers, companies, entities started to try and build AI content detectors. AI content detectors are one part of a bigger solution when it comes to information integrity and safeguarding the ecosystem, but they're not the silver bullet answer. Why? Really tricky because there's always an adversarial element. Whenever a detector gets better and starts to be able to generate AI generated, starts to be able to detect AI generated content, the generators become better too and figure out how to beat the detectors. And there's like this philosophical question as to, is there a point where the AI generated content becomes so good that even the detector can't detect it Mm -hmm. and the jury's still out on that? But also they're never a hundred percent accurate because there's so many different forms of AI generated content that all a detector can do is give you a percentage of confidence that this is AI generated or not. So 90% confident, 50% confident, Mm -hmm. 95% confident, Mm -hmm. and it could still be wrong. So every opportunity for a false positive or a false negative actually undermines the whole exercise, right? So AI content detectors are important, but they're not a silver bullet Mm -hmm. solution. They're part a broader set of solutions. That brings us to the point of uh, NHR, no human required, will be a term that we might learn about in the future. But is that really so? How powerful is AI at learning itself to get better and better without any update or upgrade? So I'm not an AI expert and I don't train the models, but with reinforcement learning, one of the really astonishing things about these models is that they can autonomously learn and iterate and improve. But my understanding is that there is always a, if you are a data scientist or helping to create these models themselves, there is always a human element towards guiding. You might not understand fully how the system gets to the result where it does, so you don't have full transparency over the entire process, but you do a little input and then you kind of see what the output is. Mm-hmm. So is it feasible that we get to a point where the machines don't need humans? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And who are the people behind the curtains programming, coding these machines, learning them to take over the world as it is? Uh, I think there's a very brilliant people at a lot of these kind of uh well, the big tech companies, but also some of the kind of generative AI startups, the most notable ones being Midjourney, OpenAI, Stability AI. Uh, Actually, we are speaking about Europe. I mean, there's been a tremendous amount of research at the universities across Europe, 
and that's hooked into the UK. We've seen real hubs in the United States. There's been a lot of research in Israel and China. I mean, the entire AI ecosystem, it, Ukraine, lots of software development and machine learning experts there. It's truly global. Mm -hmm. Aren't we forgetting that there might be a danger? I am not thinking about having to fight sentient robots. That would be silly. No, I am simply thinking about unemployment. And if these machines are so smart, then some new machines will disrupt entire markets now served by humans. Absolutely. I think that labor market disruption and job automation, including white collar jobs, is going to be a... Um, consequence of generative AI, especially as you start seeing how it quickly it's unfolding in terms of its business utility. So there will be jobs that are lost. There will be industries that are reshaped. But I don't think, as I already mentioned, that there's a finite cap on human jobs and human productivity and human creativity. And that as AI takes certain parts of the production and the workflow, that that means that there will be no new jobs for humans. Mm -hmm. There will be new jobs. They'll just be different. Mm -hmm. um, but I think those who are going to succeed are those who understand these systems, understand how to use them as a tool for their own individual pursuits. People who are quick to learn and adaptable, those are the type of people who will probably do well in this new mm -hmm. environment. And why is there a human need to let machines do the work that we do? This is probably a philosophical question about the nature of humanity. You know, why why did humans, why was it humans and not other animals that made that great cognitive leap where we invented the first tool? You know, why did we, why were we the ones who learned how to harness and tame fire? Why were we the ones that learned how to cultivate land and pioneer the agricultural revolution? I mean, it's it's just the same with this fundamental trend for humans as a species to want to utilize technology and tools to improve or change or further or better their condition of existence. And we're the only animal that does it. So that's a really philosophical question, I think, that goes deep into the nature of human beings as a species. Mm -hmm. We zijn zo terug. Ga dus vooral niet weg. Zo dadelijk meer generative AI met Nina Schick. Business AM. Radio Special Cybersecurity. Opnieuw welkom. U luistert of kijkt nog steeds naar Business AM, naar deze special over cybersecurity en wel met Nina Schick, auteur en internationaal adviseur over generative AI. Miss Schick, can you tell me a bit more about DALI, the second version of the original DALI machine? What can it do? What are the dangers? So DALI is a so-called foundational model. Now, when it comes to generative AI, foundational models are a really new phenomenon. And what is a foundational model? A foundational model is a type of AI system that can generate content that is not task specific, meaning it can do anything. And in this case, anything means images. So it can generate any image and you do it by prompting it with text. So you basically just ask it what you want it to create. And then it does that based on an interpretation of the text prompt that you give it. Now, Dali is a mashup of Salvador Dali, the surrealist artist, and Wally, -E, you know, the, the robots. I think it's from Pixar. And it was developed by OpenAI, which is a nonprofit company. Well, it started as a nonprofit, which is now very much a for-profit <laughs> company based in the U.S. in San Francisco, which has been one of the most important players in the generative AI space. They're also the developers of ChatGPT. And Dolly 2, the better version of Dolly, was only released in early 2022. I don't think it's even been a year yet. Mm -hmm. It was truly phenomenal because it was one of the first times the public or the interested public, myself included, got to play with a foundational model. You put in a text 
And then it comes out with the image from that text prompt, astounding. Mm -hmm. So since Dolly came out about a year ago, you've been starting to see many more foundational models that do the same. They can Im generate images from text prompts. But Dolly, when it first came out, was behind Rails, meaning if you can generate any image from a text prompt, you probably don't want to open it up to everyone because the potential for abuse or misinformation or disinformation or creating images that are harmful, malicious is high. So Dolly was released under kind of strict control and not everyone had access to it. But within months, there were new foundational models that could generate images. I'm thinking about stable diffusion that were mm -hmm. released open source. And they were so impactful and so many millions of people started playing with them that within a matter of weeks, OpenAI, which does think, I have no doubt, very carefully about safety and ethics, probably felt the market moved mm -hmm. and slowly, not slowly, very quickly released kind of these access rails around not only DALI, but the other generative models they've been developing mm -hmm. as well. So and DALI is important as a foundational model and mm -hmm. also some as a very accessible. Model. And how good is the output? Because I think it might be a gimmick for the creative advertising industry only or not? The output is incredible, but you have to learn how to uh, use the system. So the best outputs are from the people who do the best prompts. Where is this going to be applicable? Well, in design, in ad collateral, in images, in any kind of creative image content generation, this is like the legitimate uses. And of course, <laughs> the output can also be used in a very malicious way. Um, but the trend, when you think about these generative models, because so far we're so early in the journey, these models have become masters of one digital medium, meaning you have a model for audio, you have a model for images like Dolly, then you have a model for text like ChatGPT or um, GPT-4. ChatGPT is just an application of GPT-3.5. But the trend going forward is to have multimodal models. So mm -hmm. models that can work with audio, image, video, and text all together. Mm -hmm. 6.6 billion people now have a smartphone. That is almost 85% of humanity. Do we actually want to live in a virtual world? Because we have started to create it. And in about 15 years time, we might be in the thick of it. Is this the way forward for humanity? Or is it uh, all this just the wettest dream ever for the tech valleys in the world? That's a deep philosophical question, which I don't have a definitive answer to. But the reality is that we already live kind of in a virtual reality because every single one of us, it doesn't matter if you're an organization, a nation state, an individual, you have to exist in the digital ecosystem, right? You don't have a choice anymore. If you don't want to exist in that ecosystem, you have to take a very radical measure, which is like cutting yourself off from society and shunning uh, society and going to live in the Amazon where there's no devices, you can't be tracked, you have no email. You, That's not really a choice. Well, it is a choice, but it's a very radical choice and it's a choice that will be too difficult for many people to make. So we already kind of live in a virtual reality and the layer of generative AI into the infrastructure that we've already built with the internet, social media, the entire kind of ecosystem that's developed over the last 30 years, is only going to augment that where our experience of being human, our experience of being alive is so much of it will be in this digital ecosystem. So this is why I think not debating the merits of whether or not this is the right way for mm -hmm. humanity, because, you know, again, that's a philosophical question I don't have an answer to. But it is fundamentally going to change our experience of being human. Mm -hmm. And it's fundamentally going to change the way we live, work, even think. Yes. For most new technologies, tech companies are the driver of new business. Specifically, the competition between those companies can drive the laboratory process into real consumer and profitable processes. In this case, 
Porn could become an important flag carrier. What is porn supposed to do to launch generative artificial intelligence into the mind and pockets of humanity? So porn in this context is a pioneering use case because it was just the same with the internet. What do people do when they have these powerful digital content creation infrastructure and tools? Well, first with the internet, they went to find porn. With generative AI, they made porn. Um, pioneering in a really malicious way, though, because it was weaponizing generative AI against women who were having their identity stolen and just abused in this most harmful and pernicious and personal way. Um, with regards to generative AI and porn, I mean, there's, I think there are a few companies right now that are trying to develop AI generated pornographic content, which isn't uh, necessarily stealing someone's identity, but they're saying, oh, this is completely AI generated porn. So we should be able to engage with this as a content experience, but there's lots of ethical implications because that would have been trained on training data of authentic porn. And was that taken with consent or not? Did like the people who were in the training data, were they, uh, you know, was, was this private content or were they pornographic actors? And if so, was this content now generated with their consent? So yeah, I mean, with porn, it just has a historical place of significance in the evolution of the entire digital information ecosystem. And I think that we're just going to start to see things getting really weird on an interpersonal relationship level as well is going to be around questions of porn um, and how that warps people's perceptions of relationships, intimacy, and sex. We already know that is, is a fact and already happens. But once you throw in the AI-generated content part of it, and people start engaging with this in a virtual sense and they can, you know, mm -hmm. imagine that they're whoever they want to be uh, and they have virtual chatbot powered girlfriends. It's going to become <laughs> a very strange mm -hmm. place. How are we going to navigate this new era? Should companies pave the way first or is each individual user responsible for every step he or she wants to take into this new domain? If so, what are the safety rails? Navigating this new era, I think the first step is conceptualizing the pace and the scale and the extent of change. And then in terms of who leads the way, it can't be one person, one company, one nation state. It's a society wide effort. And I think the most important thing is the understanding that none of this is inevitable. These are not forces that are completely out of human control. They're still within our hands. We have the power to decide how these systems are going to be deployed, used, and how they're going to shape our society. So with the conceptual understanding of the scale of what is happening, and then that being followed by the understanding of our agency, to shape these tools and systems to how we want them to be, I think those are the most important fundamental next steps. Mm -hmm. We zijn nog lang niet uitgepraat en zijn zo terug met het laatste deel van het gesprek met Nina Schick over generative artificial intelligence. Business AM Radio Special Cybersecurity. Welkom terug hier bij Business AM en we zijn toe aan het vierde en laatste deel van ons uur Talk Radio. Meer bepaald de special over cybersecurity met Nina Schick, auteur en adviseur over Generative AI. As an individual and as a company, you could still shut yourself out of the internet and say, we do our job in a hands-on manner. We don't need to be fed with synthetic stories or synthetic data. So even AI has a target group, which is not necessarily the whole business ballpark? No, I disagree with that premise. I don't think you actually have a choice. If you want to engage in modern society, if you want to have a digital bank account, if you want to have email systems, if you want to have um, employees who digitally administer their payroll, 
if you have any kind of digital systems in place, if you are present in the information ecosystem, digital presence, I don't think you really have a choice of disengaging, first of all, with the internet, and then second of all, with generative AI. Because generative AI is already being deployed into the digital infrastructure as we speak, right? You don't need to have infrastructure and physical infrastructure in place like you did when the internet was first invented. You don't need cables and poles. You don't need to have physical devices as with the smartphone revolution because generative AI is already being deployed through those physical devices and that physical infrastructure that already exists. So mm -hmm. again, the first example of that is um, large language models or ChatGPT, which is now being rolled out to businesses, being as a tool for every business to have their own version of ChatGPT mm -hmm. to better internal communications or to improve their HR functions or to deal with their customer services or to deal with emails or to deal with kind of SEO, marketing. So that's only the first wave, which is enterprise copy. So given how I believe that generative AI is already becoming this new layer of the ecosystem. I don't think I agree with the premise mm -hmm. that you have a choice not to engage with it. Mm -hmm. Soon lots of the online content will be generated by machines, be it text, be it videos. Do you have a number how many percent of the content that we will consume globally will be synthetic, artificial? Well, if you imagine that 90% of the content online will be synthetically generated by 2025. I think the majority of all information that we consume is going to be AI generated. So then the real question is, is that okay? And because I think when you say AI generated, people tend to think, oh, it's just something that's made with no human agency. It's just like made by machines autonomously and while the production process is autonomous the people who are driving the vehicle or controlling the engine are still humans mm -hmm. we're not at the point of agi agi mm -hmm. meaning general artificial intelligence where machines are in control they're cleverer than humans and they're just doing things of their own wish you know they're kind of they're the the masters and we're the puppets no, it's still humans who are in the driving seat. And even though the majority of all content, the majority of our information, digital information diet will be produced and made by AI, the people who are directing the AI to do that are still people. Mm -hmm. won't, we mean, won't we become dumber as humans? We may become dumber and we may become smarter. It's, I think it's not inevitable because it will depend on our ability to have critical faculties. So do we, we might, through, through generative AI, for instance, we are going to be able to create a lot of new knowledge. We are going to be able to assess information quicker than we ever did before. We're going to be able to uh, do new information discovery, like they're using generative AI models to model new proteins for drug discovery. So I think a lot of people, or a large part of swathe of humanity, those who want to be, can use this tool as a way to become cleverer. And, you know, others will use it as a way to, it, again, this is mm -hmm. a fundamental question about human nature and how you engage with the tools and the resources that are available to you. Yes. I don't think the broader trend is that people are going to become more stupid. I think people, especially a large part of the population, right, in the so-called global south, which is now only really starting to engage with the whole internet and cell phone revolution, mm -hmm. as they start to get access to generative AI. Can you imagine how much creativity, how much um, content, how many opportunities they might engage with, which previously would have been inaccessible to them? So I still think you're going to see this democratizing power both for good and for bad and as to whether we become smarter or dumber i think that's just a question mm -hmm. of the individual yes and who owns the copyright to all of this synthetic content 
this seems like a highway or a, a fast lane for tech companies to become so powerful that we might as well start to talk about corporate government for the first time. Yeah, that's that's a good question. So two questions there, really. With the copyrights, that's all being hashed out right now in a few legal cases. So class action lawsuits where various companies or individuals have filed uh, lawsuits against generative AI companies saying that, you know, in the training data, their their content or their information was taken without consent, and therefore everything made by the generative AI algorithms is a copyright infringement. So that's going to take a long time to kind of hash out because this is entirely new. Um, press, it's an unprecedented and never before seen model to think about how do we think about copyright when AI actually creates content. And your second, the second part of the question about corporate governance, I mean, plus a chance, this has been happening for quite a few years now where we have these unbelievably powerful tech monoliths who have more influence and wealth um, power than most nation states in the world. So of course, generative AI is going to be another medium whereby their influence, power and strength will be augmented. So there really is a legitimate debate to be had about what do you do when you have private corporations and entities that are just so powerful and wealthy who are not accountable or answerable to a citizenry or a democratically elected electorate. Mm -hmm. Maybe it is not the technology in itself, but the fact that it irreversibly changes thousands of years of modern human practices and centuries of gold standards, and that just in a couple of decades. Yeah, but people argued the same about the printing press, right? That this was the most heinous thing, that it would, you know, the art of bookmaking would be destroyed by this modern technology, and now everyone would have access to books and wouldn't that be awful? And what ended up happening is that it was a revolutionary piece of technology that changed the course of human history. Without the printing press, you wouldn't have had um, the Reformation, you wouldn't have had the American Civil War, you wouldn't have the schism of the Anglican. The course of history was changed by the printing press. So mm -hmm. that has in something that we've seen with revolutionary technologies, communication technologies ever since the printing press, and it's just going to be the same with generative AI. But just like with the technical technological innovations that came before generative AI, there was always a backlash in saying that this was going to destroy kind of the pinnacle of human achievement. But essentially what happened is that it became a new tool and a new medium for people mm -hmm. to use in good and bad ways. And I think it's going to be exactly the same with generative AI. Um, some will argue this is not true artistry or true creativity, whereas others will say this is the ultimate medium for creativity and artistry. And you already see AI artists emerging now. Mm -hmm. So I think it's just a new medium. Yes. Can universal standards and uh, authorized encryption and full transparency save us from dystopian situation? It has to be part of the solution. It absolutely has to be because we've discussed some of the really exciting parts of generative AI. We've discussed how quickly it's coming. We've discussed how it's going to change everything from the world of work to the world of business. So if we don't have some kind of inbuilt transparency and security in the information ecosystem, um, then we are drinking from a poisoned well because this is our information source. We need to have security, integrity, transparency, and trust. So I'm pretty confident that these open standards that I'm helping to work on and develop are slowly going to become part of the architecture of the online information ecosystem, although it might take some time. Mm -hmm. Generative uh, AI might even challenge things that we take for granted, that we see as sacred. Should we not change so fast then? Should we stop it? I think you can have a philosophical discussion about whether we should stop it or whether we should, you know, we should let it roll, whether we should or shouldn't stop it. And that's probably an interesting philosophical discussion with merits on both sides of the argument. But if you engage with the reality, I don't think we're going to be able to stop it. Mm -hmm. So 
I'm more trying to engage with the fact that it's happening and it isn't being stopped. And as a matter of fact, it's accelerating. So mm -hmm. what do we want to do about it? How are we going to reshape our society? Like, what do we need to do to be prepared mm -hmm. to accelerate the amazing opportunities and the huge abundance that's going to be created whilst mitigating the inevitable misuses yep. and um, organization? Let me say it in your words. Will AI augment us or automate us? Yes, I think it's going to be both. It's going to be a tool for augmentation. And of course, it's going to automate certain elements of human production. And I think that the people, companies, nation states who are going to come out on top are again, those who understand what's happening and understand how to use these tools and systems to benefit them and hopefully the people that do that are doing for creative purposes for valid purposes for commercial purposes for you know good purposes rather than uh, those who will be using it to manipulate, deceive, and use it for nefarious purposes. Mm -hmm. Like they say at the United Nations, let's hope for the best and brace for the worst. Thank you very much for having had this conversation with me, Miss Nina Schick, author and international advisor on generative artificial intelligence and cyber security. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Business AM. Radio special cybersecurity.